Here's part two of the Stephen Sondheim lecture. You know, it would be several years after a funny thing happened on the way to the forum before another Sondheim piece would really be well received. He did do a number of other shows which are not as well known. Uh, Anyone Can Whistle, um, a show called Hot Spot that no one's really heard of. He worked on a piece called The Mad Show. Um, the Mad Show probably should have been a success. The Mad Show was an attempt to do a musical based on the comedy that was found in Mad Magazine and he worked on it together with Mary Rogers. Um, Mary Rogers was the daughter of Richard Rogers. She also wrote Once Upon a Mattress, a composer in her own right. And I think Rogers and Hammerstein had kind of hoped that Sondheim and Mary Rogers, who sort of grew up kind of as playmates and hanging out together, I think that they kind of might have hoped that they would get together, but Sondheim was, was not, that, that was not likely to happen at all. Um, in any case, um, the breakthrough would come in 1970 with Company, which is considered by many to be the, uh, uh, Sondheim's greatest work and is one of those pieces like Showboat and Oklahoma, which sort of single-handedly moves the theater in a brand new direction. Um, the words and the music are by the same person, uh, by Stephen Sondheim, and this is a piece to begin with for 1970 that was what they called a modern dress piece. Up until this point, you have an awful lot of musicals like Oklahoma and The King and I, which are set in foreign lands, in periods of history, in times and places that are either out of fantasy or out of, uh, you know, not the modern world, but the characters and company, especially when it was originally produced in 1970, could have just gotten their clothes from their closet and walked into a set that took place in various folks' apartments and was a modern, contemporary setting. This is something we see more of today, and I think it's kind of understood, but in the day, in 1970, this was a little bit of a turning point. Um, characters in company also lead more mature lives. They swear, they have sex, they do drugs, they drink, they, they live lives that are flawed, but that are certainly more in tune, perhaps, with a contemporary audience. There were critics at the time who felt that this was not the place for the musical to go, and that any kind of mature subject matter was best left to the film industry. Um, but nowadays, that's also fairly commonplace. Um, company really marks the true emergence of that Sondheim technique of musical scansion, the idea that I was talking about in module one. Many of the songs reflect the feelings, the emotions, the ideas that the characters themselves are experiencing. Perhaps one of the most uh, perfect examples of that would be a piece called Not Getting Married, um, in which Amy, a character who is getting married, we hear this large or orchestrated wedding typical wedding music. It's actually Sondheim's kind of puckish kind of takeoff on wedding music. And then you get what is supposedly uh, going on in the bride's head in her mental thought process during the time she's standing up at the end of the aisle getting ready to walk down. And it's all set up as a very rapid, almost Gilbert Sullivan style patter song. That juxtaposition of the sicky, sweet kind of hymn that's being played and this very rapid, nervous, staccato, um, recitative kind of material that's going on in between. That, that's a pretty good example of how Sondheim uses music to express what a character is thinking. Um, Company is really a study in the idea of marriage and in the concept of being in a committed relationship. Uh, the main character, Bobby, is sort of the perennial third wheel. He has all of these friends who are married, or at least in couples. And most of the show is about how his friends kind of feel for him and are a little bit concerned that maybe he needs to be with someone. And his dating uh, adventures with at least three different women that he meets over the course of the show who don't quite work out. And by the end of the piece, uh, Bobby, in a, in a beautiful song called Being Alive, he sort of more or less comes to the conclusion that he does need other people and yet at the same time that he needs them on his own terms and that he himself can function as a single person in the meantime. It's very moving. Um, many have said it's a, it's a very personal piece because Sondheim himself is gay. Uh, some have said that perhaps it's his view of heterosexual relationships. He has strongly denied that and he's said that that's not the case. Um, Company is revived very frequently. A recent production came out on Broadway with characters playing instruments right on stage as part of the action. I'm not sure if that worked out so well. But as a study of the institution of marriage and as a piece that is loaded with very popular songs, it also, it would be too much to call it rock or even pop, but it is much more percussive. It is much more uh, reliant on an electric guitar rather than a normal string section. It, it does 
it, it has a kind of a heavy brass section to its score, and as a result, it really does also try to move the musical in a slightly more rock-oriented direction. Um, another of the many reasons why it's kind of an of a important piece historically. I've got this list of other Sondheim musicals as we go along, and in many of these cases, I don't think we're going to dwell quite as heavily on some as others, but after Company, there is a long list of musicals in which, in one way or another, Sondheim studies ways to tell a story and, and kind of finds new ways to do that. 1971 brought a show called Follies, and um, Follies is, a, is an example of what we might call nonlinear storytelling in dramaturgy. In other words, uh, Follies takes place at a crumbling old theater, and all of the women who were once in the Follies as beautiful women are now much older and have come back for this sort of reunion. Each character is played by an older actress and simultaneously by a much younger actress at the same time. Uh, Sondheim said he was also fascinated with the notion that older people you know, had very vibrant lives that we don't know about underneath the surface, that there were jealousies, that there were wild romances and things. We don't think about that because we tend to think of these people as very staid and very quiet. So Follies kind of has these characters talking on one level and their younger selves talking on another level at the same time. With a little night music, um, this is a piece that's based on an Ingmar Bergman film, of all things, called Smiles of Summer. And night music is a real, ex it's a real experiment in songwriting. Remember we talked about time signatures a number of modules back and the difference between, say, three-quarter time and four-four time. Three quarter time being a waltz, that everything's in sets of three that are then counted in four sets of three. One, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, four, two, three. Bum, 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 That kind of beat. Little Night Music is probably the only score I know that is written entirely, deliberately, in one time signature for the entire show. All 20 songs, all two hours, are in three quarter time. The trick is that Sondheim wanted to see if he could um, challenge himself to make them sound different, to give them some sort of variety, to give them some sort of um, some sort of new, you know, some, some some sort of nuance, and and he had some success with that. I'm realizing, and I hope you'll bear with me that I should have done this in <laughs> in preparing this that I missed one, so I'm going to put a show right in here, and that show is going to be called Pacific Overtures. Pacific Overtures should have probably done better at the Tony Awards. I think it was uh, Chorus Line's big year. That might have been what happened. But with Pacific Overtures, a show about the Western quote unquote discovery of Japan, um, as viewed by the people indigenous to Japan, um, almost all of the characters, it's a tribute to a type of theater called the Kabuki Theater. Uh, which is a very minimalist and very graceful theater. The Asian scale, while we have an eight note scale, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, the Asian scale is only a five note scale. And Sondheim wanted to try to write an entire score of show tunes in that scale. Not only that, many of the songs rhythmically, as far as the number of syllables are, um, th that are in the lyrics, are written in haiku to, to kind of, again, pay tribute to that Japanese style. Um, a haiku poem has a very specific syllabic pattern. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five. That's a haiku. You can, they don't have to rhyme, and they don't have to necessarily have the sentence not finish itself in the second one over. Um, but, but that is the general pattern. There is at least one song that is entirely in that style in Pacific Overtures. Um, 1979 uh, brought probably one of the other pieces that you may have heard of and they might recognize, a show called Sweeney Todd. Uh, Sweeney Todd, which has kind of gotten, I think, sort of a, a little bit of a renaissance after the film a few years ago, um, it is designed to play as uh, a tribute to the penny dreadfuls of the Victorian era. These were novels that literally cost a penny that were designed to be extraordinarily morose and lurid, and Sweeney Todd is no exception to that. It is essentially practically an operetta, and in this respect, Sondheim is trying to pay tribute also to Gilbert and Sullivan. 
Um, very little of the, of the material is spoken. There's a little bit. Um, the difference is that, as I talked about with the anti-hero, you've got a character here who is very, very dark. Um, Sweeney Todd, if you're not familiar with this plot, I'm just going to give you a quick, super quick idea of what we're dealing with. He is a barber in Victorian London. He has been framed for a crime and sent to Australia, where a lot of criminals, by the way, were sent in the late 1800s from England. He manages to escape Australia and return to London, where he finds out that the judge who sentenced him has taken up with uh, what would essentially be Mr. Todd's daughter. We find this out later. Um, and has wanted to take advantage of Mr. Todd's wife, who has been driven mad and is now roaming the streets. Todd decides that he is going to get revenge on the judge and all of the jury and all of the people who wronged him. And in doing so, he opens a barber shop. Um, in the 1800s, barbers were expected to pull teeth, they were expected to cut hair, and they were expected to shave people. And they used a straight razor, which was sharpened on a strop, a uh, long, straight, uh, blade, extremely sharp. If you do that and you shave someone's neck, that's part of the process. If you do that and you slip, you might just cut their throat up and kill them. And Mr. Todd does that. But Mr. Todd also has a problem because these people tend to pile up. You know, if you kill people, they tend to kind of you have a problem with disposal. Mr. Todd has taken his shop above Mrs. Lovett's pie shop. Mrs. Lovett, who has a perhaps quasi-romantic interest in Todd, has offered a, a bargain of sorts. She sells meat pies. Business is very, very smooth. Mr. Todd has all of these people that are piling up. He doesn't know what to do with them. They sort of turn up in the pies, and people eat the pies, and people say that the pies are just delicious, and they don't know what the secret ingredient is, and business becomes really, really successful. This all kind of comes crashing to an end uh, in the second act, Toby, who's a really kind of childlike, per uh, big, uh, a boy who works for uh, Mrs. Lovett, kind of pieces two and two together and pushes Mr. Todd and Mrs. Lovett into the oven. Um, not the feel-good play of 1979, but nonetheless, a beloved piece. People really enjoy, I think, the dark, lurid stuff that's in it. It's, it's the close you come to real horror musical. And uh, again, this one has also been very successfully uh, revived not long ago. Um, in 1981, uh, Stephen Sondheim worked on a piece called Merrily We Roll Along. This is actually one of many musicals that we've uh, produced here at Emmanuel College some time ago. And Merrily We Roll Along has a really unique um, structure as well. An old play by Kaufman and Hart, folks who wrote Can't Take It With You, it's one of the things. It's about three friends growing up in college and how they swear they're always going to be close and they're always going to be together and they grow apart. One of them develops a serious drinking problem and, and, and her life sort of falls apart. One of them uh, has a divorce and becomes a much more bitter person and two of them, the, 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 the two men in this trio of, of, of people um, who start out as the best of friends form a working relationship and are become embittered when, when success drives them apart. And Sondheim felt that this was a great play, but it was kind of depressing. And that it would be interesting to see what would happen if an entire show was written and performed backwards. So the play begins, actually, um, in a terrible place where all of the characters have grown apart and they're all angry and, and speaking horribly of each other, and some characters have passed away, and some tragedy has happened. But with each scene, the characters get younger. Some of the characters who've passed away come back and join us. Some of the characters, their, their fashions sort of reflect a few years earlier, and they keep getting younger. We know what's coming because we watch it in reverse, and kind of a heart, you know, kind of a bittersweet thing when the very last scene in the play is these three characters sitting on a rooftop at college graduation, saying, well, we're always going to be friends, aren't we? Oh, yes, I'd never do anything to betray you. And boy, isn't life great, this one moment where we've got all of our lives ahead of us. Um, audiences were a little confused by Merrily We Roll Along. And its original script did not, or its original production, did not allow for the costumes to change and for the fashions to help us know what year it was. Uh, Sondheim had to add um, little intros that said things like 1960, you know, would actually say what year it was. Um, 
he took Merrily very personally. It's probably the only show of his that closed within a month, in this case, just over two weeks. It was later revived with a lot more success um, uh, just a few years after, and Sondheim said that it was the big mistake of his life, that he had figured out the flaws and the problems with it before it opened. Um, and nowadays, it's a very popular piece, as I've said, for a lot of people, especially colleges and universities do it a lot. Um, speaking of popular pieces, 1985's Into the Woods, you may have seen the film. I don't have to tell you everything here, I don't think, but I want to make sure it's clear this is another exploration of the anti-hero in Sondheim. It was inspired when he read a book that was popular among uh, education theorists and people who dealt with child uh, psychology, a book called uh, Uses of Enchantment by a man named Bruto, Bruno Bielheim. Bielheim posited that children's fairy tales are cautionary in nature. That the reason we tell them is that we, we tell children things like this character strayed away from home and look what terrible thing happened to them. Or this character developed into a grown-up and look at the terrible responsibilities that they had to have. Almost every character who leaves their parents or who wanders away in a classic fairy tale, according to Bailheim, is punished. And that these stories were designed to help scare children and keep them safe. Sondheim kind of took that and ran with it and said that maybe there was more to it, because that maybe the, the show should be about that period in life when our parents stop being the absolute authority on everything that is right and wrong and become somebody that you call every other day on the phone, maybe, and become a friend rather than an authority. Um, perhaps the most telling piece of metaphor in the play has to do with the narrator. Um, the show has all of your favorite fairy tale characters in it, as I'm sure you may have heard. It features Cinderella and Red Riding Hood and Jack of the Beanstalk and all those characters. And it's narrated. And when Jack steals some stuff from the giant, and the giant's wife actually comes down and threatens all of the fairy tale characters and says, who, who robbed my house? Who killed my, my husband? I want revenge. First of all, it points out that people's actions have consequences. And then the narrator steps forward and you know, talks for a little while about how these characters were not really equipped to deal with their own responsibilities like this. The giant demands a sacrifice and says, somebody should be killed, somebody should be blamed for this. And the other characters kind of slowly look over to the narrator and realize there's somebody that we can sacrifice. And they say, here, it was, it was the narrator's fault, you should go kill him. And the giant does. The giant crushes the narrator. And the narrator's flattened. And then there's like a giant pause. And all these characters say, well, now what do we do? We always lived in a world where we had somebody who told us every single fact and when to do this and when to do that, and now we have to make these decisions for ourselves. That's the real seed and the real point of Into the Woods, is this notion that when we outgrow our parents, sometimes that's a blank page and sometimes that's scary. Whether it's a character like Rapunzel getting out of, the, um, out of a tower and the witch trying to keep her young and trying to imprison her so that she doesn't meet anyone new, um, character like Cinderella getting married, but then realizing that, that chasing the boy was not as interesting, is more interesting than being married to him, and the, she and the prince semi amicably realizing that there are other fish in the sea and walking away from their marriage. Um, it's kind of the fairy tales, but with consequences. And the film that came out recently is actually not bad. A lot of people were very concerned because some had had this, <laughs> he made this mistake of, of like, saying that they were considering changing the fate of some of the characters in the film. And since the film is so, or since the play is so much about consequences, I think a lot of people were concerned. But much of it is, is, is still very, very faithful, and, and the music is, is quite solid. Um, the show that Sondheim wrote in 1991 was called Assassins. And i got to tell you, first of all, on a personal note, uh, my own graduate work, I was the director of the Boston premiere of Assassins here in the 1990s when it came over to the Boston Center of Arts. And I was lucky enough to be able to communicate with Mr. Sondheim and a few other people about, about the show. And I have a real, a, a, a real personal spot for this show. I don't want to dwell on all of it. I don't want to tell you everything because I feel like it is, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of excessive to give you every single detail. But, in terms of this exploration of the anti-hero, Assassins is a musical 
about every person who has tried to kill the President of the United States. Uh, John Wilkes Booth appears in it, Lee Harvey Oswald appears in it, some lesser people that you may or may not recognize, who, if you could look it up, are also real historical people, all the way up to John Hinckley, who attempted to assassinate Ronald Reagan in the 80s. Each of them have a song. A couple of things you may not notice right off the bat, but the songs which are titled The Ballad of, The Ballad of John Wilkes Booth, The Ballad of Leon Cholgosh, um, a couple of others, Generally, if you successfully killed your person, your song is called The Ballad Of. And if you did not, your song just has a regular title and you share it with someone else. Second, many of the songs that are written in Assassins are written in the musical style that was appropriate to the time period that that character came from. In other words, when you have a piece about an attempt on Franklin Roosevelt's life, it's got all these Sousa marches and it sounds like the the Washington Post March and all this sort of World War II type of material. Um, a song about the attempt on Charles J. Guiteau uh, in his attempt at his successful assassination of Garfield in 1881 um, is a cakewalk song that would have been appropriate to that time period and, and so on. Um, it also is very much a piece about attention. It's a piece about the notion that people can become famous really in two ways. They can do a whole lot of things and become famous and accomplish things, or they can kill the person who accomplished the things and become infamous. Every child in school knows who John F. Kennedy was, but unfortunately every child in school also knows who Lee Harvey Oswald was. Even though Oswald had no college education, dropped out of the army, had no job to speak of, and is credited with killing Kennedy, whether you believe it or not. Um, this is a big point of assassins, this idea that does the American dream promise a prize to every person, whether they like it or not. And to that end, it works. It's a very, very challenging piece to work on. Um, it's hard to make audiences warm to these characters who've essentially attacked, not only committed murder, but attacked an American institution. Uh, perhaps the other unfortunate thing, the show opened originally in 1991. When it came time for the show's 10th anniversary, uh, the idea was that it would reopen on Broadway and an entire production was put together and mounted and set to perform, its opening night would have been September the 12th, 2001. That didn't happen, owing to September 11th, 2001, and even then it became evident as things slowly returned to normalcy, the feeling was that this particular show with characters attacking America was really not the show to put on. And so that, that revival was shelved for a bit, and eventually it returned to Broadway to some accolades a little bit later, I believe in early 1992. Um, 1994 brought uh, Sondheim its most recent Tony Award for a piece called Ta uh, Passion. Uh, it's a very tangled story of love and betrayal in the years following the Civil War. It's very spare and it's very small compared to some of these other big, large Sondheim shows. In this case, what he said was, I want to try to write a small show. I want to try to do something uh, that, cut, that, that, that is communicated through letters and through uh, notes back and forth between characters. He also had trouble writing the main character who becomes obsessively in love with this man and is described in the play as sort of unappealing and almost aggressive, almost a stalker. Um, and he wound up writing a song called Loving You in which he he said it was one of the easier songs he ever wrote because it's very simple, but it suggests that her love for this other character, as she says, is something is, is nothing I control. And she says it's just part of who I am. And it became, that one song I think really turned around the show. It was added after a short time and audiences weren't responding so well until they gave Tosca, the, the, this main character, this song. And then people said, oh, I guess I feel bad for her. I think I understand now. Along the way, Sondheim has also dabbled in film. Um, he won an Oscar for the weirdest thing. He for, wrote the song uh, Sooner or Later, which appeared in the Disney live-action film Dick Tracy. It was performed by Madonna. He wrote all of Madonna's songs for Dick Tracy. Um, he wrote a non-musical play called Getting Away with Murder, a mystery in 1996. He has worked as the guest author of the New York Times crossword puzzle and made puzzles for the New York Times on multiple occasions. Um, in 1999, he was awarded the Kennedy Center Honor for Outstanding Contributions to the American Arts. Um, a couple of shows that are interesting that kind of came together after Passion. In 1995, we have a piece called Putting It Together. Now, you may have heard of musical reviews 
and about how really they're just sort of like the best songs by this person put together as a concert. Sondheim was often accused of writing songs that were very, very specific to the plots of his shows. And they said, you know, unlike other writers, when you take a song out of the show, unless you know the story to the show, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And therefore, he was told it would be difficult to write a review or a concert of his material. What he wound up doing, working with a number of other people, such as uh, Christopher Durang and uh, uh, Sigourney Weaver and some others, was putting together a new show with a plot that takes place at this cocktail party at this people's house, but that still uses songs from all the other shows in a new context, as if to say, see, I can use these songs again, and they don't have to apply to the things that you originally wanted them to. Finally, in just a couple years ago, in 20, uh, really barely, uh, 2014, we had a musical called Sondheim on Sondheim, which is a very odd multimedia show. It's really kind of the next level of material. Stephen Sondheim recorded a series of short pieces of interviews in which he details the, the story of his life and his career, and in some cases, how he wrote songs. This footage, was incorporated into the show via projections and sometimes on the walls and sometimes on the floor and, and built into the set. And a group of actors would come out and sing the songs that would illustrate the points that he was making about his life at a given time. He also allows people in that show a really strange sort of look inside the songwriting process because a couple of the songs in it are rough drafts of songs. So an actor will come out and sing the first version of Being Alive that was a totally different song, that has kind of the same sentiment, that was, mm, I don't think this is quite right. And then he'd say, and so I changed the lyrics a little, and they came out more like this. And then a person would come out and sing the second draft. And finally, they will sing the song as we know it. Um, it's a really unusual show in that when MTI began offering it as a show that colleges and community theaters could perform, it comes with all of the projection footage of Sondheim talking. And the conversation, his, his speech, his conversation, is, is written directly into the orchestration, so that there's stuff for the orchestra to play at certain times, and stuff for the actors to come out and sing. It probably is another case of Sondheim is, I don't want to say he's unkind to actors, but he certainly is very constricting and not the most trustful of actors, so he tends to construct shows and projects that, that, that is sort of like, if you follow this pattern the way I'm telling you to, you will look good. And if you deviate from it, it might be bad for you because there's no escape hatch in the music to help you get out of that. Um, Sondheim on Sondheim is full of, well, I'm talking and I'm a recording and then you're gonna drift on and sing at this exact point and then drift off and then we're gonna do that some more. It's a fascinating piece because it really shows you how songs are written and there's a lot of fascinating anecdotes in it. But ultimately, it's also a very constricting piece for the performers. Um, in, in his spare time, genius that I guess the man is, when West Side Story was revived a few years ago on Broadway, since he was the original lyricist, he said, you know, one of the things I've always thought was wrong about that show, it's supposed to be between, about the clash between his, Hispanic and non-Hispanic cultures. So he picked up some, taught himself some Spanish, and wrote an entire new set of lyrics to West Side Story in Spanish that rhyme, that still say the same thing that the original lyrics conveyed, and are now available. You have your choice if you collect if you do that show and you get the rights to it through a catalog, uh, you can sing it with the Spanish lyrics or the the original lyrics. Um, the final uh, the, the final lecture that we have is going to cover two people: uh, Jerry Herman, who was. Uh, composer just around the same time, and uh, the songwriting team of Candor and Ebb, uh, they're going to kind of bring us into the, the modern day, and, and the, the, we'll talk about some shows that are still running right now. Um, that'll be on Friday's lecture. You'll get that, and in a separate package on Friday will also come the final exam. The final exam will feature some song identification. There will be songs on the final exam. In other words, there'll be questions where you will be clicking on part of the question and it will play an excerpt from a song that we have covered and talked about. I will be providing you ahead of time with a list of the songs to look for. Um, I may ask you for the composer. I may ask you for the show title that it came from. I may ask you a general fact about the song. But there will be that listening piece. So when you do take the final, make sure you're in a place 
where you can sit and actually listen to each of the clips that are connected to, this, to these questions. If you do have questions about that or anything else about the course, obviously, as always, drop me an email. Thanks for listening, and there will be one more lecture on Friday about Herman and Kander and Ed. I'll see you then.